going to share my screen. I thought I had done that earlier. Can you guys see, see the screen now? Would you like me to go back and start again? That's a serious yes, question. Yes, please, if you wouldn't mind. I will go back. I apologize. Thank you. No problem. Oops. Okay, we're going to start at the beginning. And again, my apologies. So, we're starting with data storage. Data storage is the ability to store our information in a way that's not dictated by the fact that a file is going to stop, that, that my Python script is going to stop running. Okay, I want to have this data persisted for as long as I want it persisted. And right now, up until this point, everything we have done has been about in the running program, and as soon as Python goes away, that data goes away. So we have some new keywords, and I apologize that this says functions. It should say files, and I'll correct that. So we have an open, a close, and a read function, and they are all, and there's actually a whole lot more to do with files. And then we have, have a new uh, operator called with, and with negates the need for close. And I'll explain why that's important when we get to a few slides down to file descriptors. Um, but open basically says, give me the ability to get to the data in a file. It does not give you the data itself. Close says, I'm going to now give the file descriptor back to the operating system. And read says, get me all the contents in a file. And if your file is small, that's perfect. If you have a really big file, it's not. So we're going to have to look at ways to read data from a file incrementally. We won't do too much of that in this class, but it's important to note that read is a great place to start, but it doesn't do really good if you've got really, really large uh, files. So um, what's a file? Well, a file is anything that is sitting on your computer right now. This presentation is a file. The Python script that you uh, wrote last week and turned in for your Dragon game is a file. Microsoft, every Microsoft executable that you have ever used is a file. Everything that sits on the computer is a file. Well, what we have to do is figure out how to get to it um, and change it and store it. So what can I do with a file? Well, I can create the file. I can read or access the data in the file. I can update it or write data or append data to a file because those are all forms of updating. And I can get rid of the file altogether. I can just delete it. So an operating, all operating systems handle files differently. Windows, the Windows operating system handles files and all the structures around them differently than Linux does, differently than Mac does, although Mac and Linux are pretty close. Um, and so every action you take on the file, you are going to interact with the operating system. I, as a computer programmer, don't want to write um, a lot of different code to handle different operating systems. I want to write my code once and just have it work. Now, you know, way back in the olden days when I used to write C and C++, we had to be very careful because you, you would have to have different code bases. You'd have to split your code base because You'd have to have certain different operations if you were going to run it on Linux, certain different operations if you were going to run it on Windows. So, but I don't want to do that these days. And Python allows us to avoid that because it handles the interaction with the operating system. You can look at this stuff as like layers, like even a layer cake. Okay, you've got the hardware is the bottom. Then you've got the operating system. And up until, you know, 10 years ago or so, maybe 15, you pretty much then had to deal with the programming language right on top of the operating system. 
Languages like Python and Java give us an additional layer. So you have the hardware, you have the operating system, and then you have an interpreter. And then on top of that interpreter, you actually have your code. That interpreter takes away the need to understand what the operating system is actually doing um, and just allows us to write the code. And I, I, I like that. That's one of the reasons I like Python and I like Java. And um, this is called Write Once, Run Many. So a file has properties. File has a name, a size, and a location on disk. The location on disk is it's an address. It's just the location that it tells you. We will see that as a directory structure. The operating system sees that as something different. But for us, location on disk is the directory structure. How much size does that file take up? That's kind of an important thing. Um, not just for the operating system, but when we are going to access the data in a file, we don't want to necessarily read in 10 gigab a 10 gigabyte file into our little Python script. We need to manage that differently. And it has a name. Um, this is all called the metadata. And Python gives us a file object, or something called a file descriptor. And that file descriptor gives us the, a pointer, really, that allows us to get to all this information. It doesn't give us the information, it allows us to get to the information. Now these things are called, let me go back, sorry, these things are called file descriptors. Actually I think I talk about file descriptors a little later, so I'll say that in just a minute. Okay. Okay, properties and contents. All right. So here's where I'm going to talk about file descriptors. So my file is a variable just like any other variable is in Python. When you're dealing, it's on the left-hand side, a single equal sign, so you know it's a variable. When I use the open function, and when, in fact, I access any data at all in a file, I will start by using the file descriptor. The file descriptor is what is returned by the open function. And a file descriptor, it gives you the file metadata, all of those properties we just talked about, and it allows you to access the data within the file. It doesn't give you that data. It just gives you the ability to get to it. Now, a file descriptor is, in fact, a system resource. Even though we've removed ourselves from the operating system by using Python and the Python interpreter, we have to remember that I am taking up a system resource. And if I take up that system resource, I don't give it back, and I do that enough time, I run out of system resources. So you, this is the first time when we have to really consider dealing with system resources and remembering that when I take it, I have to give it back. So open is the function, and it provides that file descriptor the first argument in that function is the name of the file. Now in this case, the name of the file doesn't have a directory structure, but you will often have to give it a fully qualified file name, and that means having the directory structure there or having the ability to have Python create the directory structure. And then there is the mode. There are four modes, read-only, write-only, append, and binary. These can be combined. And um, they just simply tell the operating system what you're going to do with the file. Most, most of the things that I do are read-write because I'm opening it and I'm going to change it somehow and I'm going to write it back to disk. But these are all the different modes. You can combine them. We're going to talk a little teeny bit about binary, but we really don't do much with binary in the class. Okay, now I have that close function. The close function releases the file descriptor to the operating system. So open has retrieved um, the file descriptor and close returns the file descriptor. And there are only so many file descriptors 
on your operating system, so you on anybody's operating system. So you always have to remember if you have opened, you have to close. Um, so a good thing to remember here, and I'm glad I put that rule up. Um, if your if Python does not find the file, if your file does not already exist on disk where you're telling Python to look at it, Python will create the file. It'll create it and use it in whatever mode you have done. So if you it creates the file and then it, you've only opened it for read, there's not going to be anything to read. But Python will in fact create the file with an open. All right, read data from a file all at once. So remember that my file is not the contents of the file. It is simply a way to get to the contents of the file. And then I have to get the data out of the file. So how do I read the content? With the read function. My file, you saw the, the line on the last slide. I'm going to open my first file.txt. My little representation is on the right-hand side of the screen, and I'm going to read the data from that file. So my stir is going to um, get from the file descriptor the data. So this is what it's going to be. It's going to look just like that. This is a text file um, with a new line character with two lines. So it's reading it as a string. And again, when Python pulls anything in externally, except if you're using a binary file, it's a string until you tell it, it's, until you tell Python it's not. So that's what read does. It read doesn't get me all the content, sorry, it doesn't get me the descriptor information. It actually gets me the contents of the file, whatever is in that file. And then I have to remember to close. Now, once I close, my file is still a variable, but anything I do on it, it's not going to matter. It's just going to give you an error. So you have to remember that when I open my file, I've done some stuff with it, and I've closed the my file variable, the file descriptor is no longer available. So anything you do with that variable will incur an error. So. How do we read diff files in different ways? So right now we're going to read it as a list with a separator of a new line. Well, why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because you might actually have to do something like this in one of your labs. So I have my open statement. I'm going to open it for reading. And now I have a variable called my list. And I'm going to say equal my file dot read line. Read lines is a function provided by Python, and that's just what it does. It will read each and every line of that file and put it into a list. So in this case, when I read my information from the file, I get a list. So I have this as a file as the first string in the list and with two lines as the second. Now, if you are reading a file line by line by line, this is a really handy thing. You don't have to worry about splitting. Okay, All you have to do is say, read each line and put it into a list, and then you already have it in a structure that you know what to do with. So read lines is a very, very handy function. And then, of course, we have the close. And I'm going to be saying close this entire lecture because it's the one thing that a lot of students forget to do and then things don't work quite right. So now I want to read it line by line. So I don't want to have it come in as a full list. I just want to go line by line. Maybe I have to make a decision based on each line of the file. So this time, I'm going to open it just like I did before. See, the open doesn't change. And in this case, I'm just going to have a four. I say four line. Line is just a variable that's available only in the scope of the for loop. Now, I'm using the in operator here. I've used the in operator with lists, but now I can use it with files. So four line in my file. 
and I'm just going to print mine. So that's all I have to do to run through a file is say for whatever my variable is in whatever my file descriptor is. And Python will do that for me. So it will actually treat it like a list, but I don't have to necessarily create a list from it. Is anybody asking questions? Sorry, I wasn't. Uh, no, we're good. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. Closing a file. You see me do this a couple of different times, and I'm going to basically just say again, file descriptors are a system resource. If you are, if we're just working on a small Python script for class, um, you know, am I going to harm my computer by not closing my file? No, you're not going to harm your computer. Um, but you need to get into the practice if you're going to be out there and a programmer, you have to manage resources. And file descriptors are resources, just like you have to manage RAM, you have to manage speed, you have to manage the other system resources. Um, so close does a couple of things. It will write any data held in RAM to the actual file, and it removes your access to it and it allows the operating system to reuse the file descriptor. Now I just said something about RAM. So writing to a file. Python and most languages don't write directly to files. What they do is they have a buffer. It's just kind of a temporary collection place. Before they write it to a file. Now why in the world do we do this? Well, we do it because the most expensive operation that you have on any computer system is when you persist data to the hard drive. So if we are persisting data to the hard drive, we want to not do that every time we're changing a character because it is an expensive operation. And when you get to the point where you're starting to um, write programs professionally, or even if you're just doing it for your own fun. Let's say you want to go and try creating your own game. You care about how fast things are. And one of the ways to make things seem faster is to only write data to a file after, you know, your buffer's filled up. So that's why we don't use we don't directly write to file. That's why everything is done via a buffer. So I've opened a file, my empty file.txt for writing. That's what the W is for. So it's going to create an empty file, and I'm going to now use the write function against my file descriptor to put things into the file. But things won't go into the file. They're going to go into the buffer. Nothing has gone to the file yet. And when I close, I'm now going to actually write the information from the buffer to my empty file.txt. That is the only way you can get data into a file. It has to go through the buffer. That's another reason why it's important to close. And when you're doing the labs this week, if things aren't turning out right, if, you know, Zybooks is telling you that one of your files isn't right, make sure you've closed because it may simply be that your data hasn't actually been written to the file. And that's why Zybooks is having a problem with it. Um, you can open a file for reading and writing using RW. All right. Uh, writing to a file 
before you close it? What if I don't want to close it? What if I don't want to store, you know, massive amounts of data in my buffer? Maybe I'm creating data. Maybe I've got some crazy algorithm running. And, but I don't want to store that in RAM and then write it as one big chunk. Maybe I want to write it occasionally. So there is a way to do that. If I open my big file, and I've just got a for loop, just as an example, and I'm going to write my big file. So I'm writing big file to my big file. Now, what if I want to flush it? What if I want to write the data occasionally? I can do that by the uh, function flush. So, and this is just a quick example. Let's say I am creating a lot of data in a for loop, and I want to make sure that after either a certain amount of time or a certain amount has been written into the buffer, that I actually write that to file. So when I hit the flush function, that is when it is going to create the file. And then when I'm all done, I can close the file, and it will, in fact, uh, write data to the file. I don't know why my file isn't showing up. So that's what flush is. Oh, there's my file. Wrong order. So let's go out and look at a little bit of code, and then we'll start talking about with. Can the buffer size be specified from inside Python? Um, actually, I think that you can when you are dealing with buffered reading and buffered writing. So there is, well, when you're dealing with data streams. So when you are working with files, what you really want to do is set up the ability to not read everything into memory. And the way you do that is coming up with a buffered stream, basically. And when you, when you open it and you access it in that sort of way, you are given the opportunity to set the size of the buffer. For just normal reading and writing that we are doing in this class, we're not going to use that. But if you are out with Python and you're using some more of the features that Python has for files, yes, you can in fact specify um, the actual size of the buffer. You can actually do things like also like put timers on. You know, make sure your code isn't re-entrant, put timers on, and then when the timer goes off, it suspends activity for a moment, it flushes the buffer, and then everything starts up again. So there's all kinds of things you can do to manage that buffer that we don't get into in this class. So let us um, uh, let's see. Oh, that's just the text file. Um, let's just do my big file. So that's the text. That's the binary. Oh, sorry, that's my binary file. Uh, where's the actual code? My big file. Bytes, comma delimited, flush, is that it? Okay, my big file. So let me start by removing this file because I'm going to create it. I'm going to delete the file. So my big file, delete anyway. My big file.txt doesn't exist. And I did that because I want to show you what happens when I try and open it. So this is basically the example we just saw. And as we all know, I like the debugger. So we're going to go into the debugger. And whoops, what happened? Oh, wait a minute. Got to specify the right file. That would help. Okay, seven, there it is. 
Okay. Ah. Uh, flush. I can't read, obviously. Flush. Okay. Now we're going to try and run it again. Much better. So I, you'll notice there's no mybigfile.txt over here. So when I open it, and by the way, this time I'm going to open it for writing. And what you will see is, oh, it hasn't actually written anything, so it has not yet created mybigfile.txt. But what you will see under the variables is it has given you this uh, wrapper. The wrapper is just the file descriptor. We were talking about the buffer. This is the buffer. It's part of the text IO wrapper object that we are being given by Python. And then I've just got some, some additional metadata here. The mode that it was written, the name of the file, um, and the encoding is UTF-8, all of that. And there's nothing really going on in the buffer. So I have a file object. I haven't written anything to disk yet. So now if I, let's just step over it for a minute. So I still don't have my big file here. And now I'm going to write my big file dot format counter. You'll notice I still don't have a my big file under the projects. And so I'm just going to run it because I don't need to step through this. Um, sorry, it's printing flushing. So we'll do that. So it's flushing. And when it flushes, there's, oh, that's my byte. Let's run it. Okay. Let's see that. It should have written. You can't see that there. My big file. Externals. Files. Let's keep going. Okay. There it is. I apologize. It only wrote it on the close. But it should have flushed the buffer and written it. I'm not sure what just happened. I will I'll go back and look. Sorry about that. But you get the gist, OK? Um, that's how writing the file goes. I don't know why it didn't show up here in PyCharm. It should have shown up on the operating system. It may just be how PyCharm handles what's going on in the project section. So uh, with. With is the new keyword operator. And um, it really does help because you don't have to worry about closing. It does all of that for you. So I have a different, instead of my file equal open, I have a different line here. And it starts off with the keyword with. With basically says, I want to manage this file and automatically close it when the loop is done. With is a form of a loop. And what it will do is it will read the file line by line and do something with it. So in this case, I'm going to open my text, my text file.txt as my file. My file is just a variable. That's all it is. It will contain the file descriptor. And that file descriptor, my file, will be reused until every line of the file has been read. And then when it is done, it's closed automatically. So I just have my file.txt over on the right-hand side with some metadata and two lines in it. 
So my file will be the file object. So I can say line equal my file dot read line. And read line is just a function that says read the line, read one line of the file, read the next line of the file. So I'm at the if I'm at the very beginning of the file, the next line is line number one. And then it will read line number two. And then it will read line number three. And in this case, I'm just going to print the line. Then it's going to do it again. And I'm going to print line two. And then the file will close automatically. And you can do that for reading or for writing. Um, uh, let's see. The width is going to process it until it reaches the end of the file. Width always indicates a loop, and it will always automatically close. I use width a whole lot when I am programming in Python. It just makes my life easier. Um, working with the operating system, this is very uh, um, kind of, this, this is how you neutralize working with the operating system in Python. Um, because in Linux you have slashes one way, in Windows you have slashes another, in Windows you start off, you know, with a C colon or whatever your drive, um, uh, uh, yeah, your drive letter is in Linux, you start off, you know, at slash. So how do we normalize this? Um, you can write your Python scripts so that you can run it on any operating system and not having to worry about making changes. Um, we don't really go into that because we don't use it on the labs for this week. But they do have a section in Zybooks. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about modules. Actually, I think I'm going to go do a lab for width, and then we'll talk about modules. Okay, so with. Okay, this is real. This is basically what we just saw. Um, so I have many lines.txt. I'm reading it, and I have my file object in something called f. So I'm going to read my file line. I'm going to print it. And then I'm going to say for line in FL print line. Let me look at my many lines.txt. So line one, line two, line three, and line four. I don't know why I have that other one there. So let us just run this. Okay, and that's all it did. So it just, um, yeah, it just read everything in and printed them out. That's all it did. And it's that easy, and I don't have to worry about closing. Okay. Modules. Why are we talking about modules when we're talking about files? Well, because modules are Python files. They are groups of Python code that, um, that you can use by name. So you can define an object or a whole series of functions and put them in a module, and then you can get to it by the module name. So the module name is just going to be whatever the file name is. Um, and then you can get to things, depending on how you use the module, you can get to things by module name dot, or you can import certain things from it. Um, and Python has thousands of modules. There are all kinds of modules out there um, with, with, for Python. They're just they're massive amounts. And it's always a good thing to explore. One of the things I generally do when I'm starting out a new project is I go out and I see what modules are available for open source because I don't necessarily want to reinvent the wheel. Um, my company doesn't want to pay for me to reinvent the wheel. What I want to do is I want to be as effective and efficient and using modules 
can be effective and efficient. And by the way, you don't have to go out and use somebody else's module. You can use, and I suggest you use modules when you're writing your code as a way of um, as a way of organizing it because it's very, very helpful. Why am I talking about modules right now? Because we have a module that allows us to interact with the operating system. Um, the module is called OS, and this is one of those things where you have path separators for different for Windows and Linux. One is forward slash, one is backward slash, um, and this matters if you're having to give a path. So if I have a file that's not in the current directory, because when we look at PyCharm, everything we've done so far, these files are all in the current directory. I am not changing directories one way or another. So how do I do it if I have a file in a different directory? Well, this is how we do it, OK? Uh, Python gives us an OS module, and I have a keyword called import. Import just says somewhere out there, there's going to be a file named, in this case, os.py. Go find the file and read the entire contents of that file into my working memory space, into RAM. That's what the import command does. So it's good to remember that it does that, because if you have a huge module or you have to load 50 modules in, and you really only need a couple functions from each of those, you're taking up a lot of RAM in your computer just to load those in. So you can actually do from the name of the module import and then you can import just a specific thing. For right now, we're going to import from OS. And OS is just an external script, so it would be os.py. And so here, I don't want to deal with slashes. I want to say home L Shannon module 6, lex six lecture.key. And that's where I want to tell it to go. And if I am on Linux, it's going to say, that's what it's going to tell me. If I'm on Windows, that's what it's going to tell me. So that's what it does for you. Um, and there's actually lots of other things you can do with the OS module than just have it tell you what kind of flashes you need. Um, binary data. Not all data on a computer is human readable. In fact, most data on a computer is not human readable. Um, and so we, people store it in binary format. You look, if you tried to just open up a Microsoft Word document in a text editor, you would get gobbledygook. Would not be anything like what you had been typing on when you created that document. That's because it's binary data, probably encoded and binary, but definitely binary. Um, so imagery, movies, audio, Microsoft Office, so many things are binary data. So it's, un it's important to understand what it is. And what it really is is it's not human readable. Um, you can create a binary file by simply using a B in front of, in this case, a string called bytes. So this is a new nomenclature for us. We haven't done this before. What I have here is I have my underscore bytes equals, then I have a B that's not in quotes. And that's kind of strange because everything we've done that has anything that looks like a string for it has to be in quotes. But that B is not in quotes. And then after that, you ha we have a quote, bytes, end quote. Bytes is a string. It's a normal string. B is a special nomenclature that tells Python that this is going to be bi that my bytes is going to be binary. And that's what that does. Um, and then if I want to print my bytes and, and type my bytes, whoops, sorry about that. Um,
I don't know why I didn't put the stuff out here. But I can print my bytes and I can type my bytes. Let's go down and do this. Okay. Bytes. Okay. So here we have a simple byte uh, function. And I just have my bytes and then I have print the type of my bytes and my bytes. And then I can pack everything together and then I can um, struct.pack is just going to tell me how to structure it. I'm going to pack it all together and I'm going to write a file called my byte file. WB says write it as a binary file and then I'm going to write everything to the file and I'm going to close the file. So and when I do that my byte file ends up looking like this. So and this is a rudimentary example of how you do things binary, uh, sorry, in bytes. Um, and this will all be up on the site, but there is, there's actually a whole kind of school of programming on how to deal with imagery data and what you deal with imagery data or how you deal with audio video data that all has to do with non-readable human non-human -re non readable files. Oops, wrong one. Okay, so now comma separated files. Why are we talking about comma separated files? We are talking about comma separated files and the CSV module because you have to use it in lab 7.8. Now a comma separated value is very much like um, a spreadsheet. Sometimes um, they basically have values that are comma separated and if there are new lines you can treat it like a multi-dimensional list. Um, and that's where CSV and kind of processing come together. Um, so I have a file that's just words.csv and it's just got you know words separated by commas so I want to treat it as a comma separated file and I want to read it as a CSV file so I have a list and I'm going to open words.csv as words so I've just opened something. I know I'm going to get the data out of it. Now, here is where we change things up. We have some content equals csv.reader words comma delimiter. And the delimiter in this case is a comma. Could have been a percent. It doesn't matter. It's a character. And what that will give me is it'll say um, it, it's a matrix, basically. So I'm going to say for row and content in case there are multiple lines in the file because this will in fact, if, if there's a single line in the file, it'll be a single list. This comes in handy when you have multiple lines in a file because it will create that multidimensional list for you. So I'm just going to go through each row and um, if counter not in word list, Make sure the word isn't already in the list. So this is something similar to what you have to do for your lab. And then I'm going to append the, the element in the row. So basically what we're doing is we're using the CSV reader. We're going through any content that's in a row. Um, and then I'm going to go through everything that is in fact in that row. And if it's not already in the word list, I'm going to add it to the word list. Um, and what the CSV reader really does for us is if, if there's a lot of data, it organizes it for us. And you have to do it for your labs. Okay. The contents, for 7.9, the contents of dict.txt contains key value pairs. Unfortunately, the key is stored on a different line as the value. The key in the first line and the value is on the second. Create a dictionary from the file and print it out 
in a format of key colon value. So what you have is you have some um, you have some amount of data, and you know that the first element in the in the file is going to be a key, and the second element is going to be a value. The third element is going to be a key and the fourth element is going to be a value. And that seems like to me that you could read it in as a list, and then every other element, you just have the key and then the value, and then the key and then the value. So here's just contents. Um, is name, Lisa, answer, 42, amount, and 3.14. So that's a, essentially what I've got. I'm not reading the file right now, but I am created, creating a dictionary. I'm going to create an empty dictionary. I'm going to say for counter in range, len of contents. And then I'm going to say if counter plus 1 is less than the contents and counter modulo 2 is 0, which just says that I am um, counter modulo 2 is 0, which means I'm um, on the second line. I'm on the even lines. Then I say if the, um, the contents of counter is not in the dictionary, then I add it. And then when I'm done, I can print it out. So that that's how you go about this and this is going to be needed for 7.9 so while I did not read it out of a file um, you are going to read it out of a file but you're going to read it in such a way that it comes in as a list so we saw how to do that in one of the earlier slides once you read it as read it in as a list you know what to do with it that's just the Python we've done previously. And this, in case, is saying every, you know, every odd row is a key, every even row is a value. Every odd row is a key, you know, even row is a value. Make sure that you don't already have that information in the dictionary, which is where the if comes in. Then add it to the dictionary, and when you're done, print it out. So even though 7.9 is talking about reading things out of a file. That's really the smaller portion. The larger portion is simply going to be processing it correctly. And what I really just wanted to kind of say is that you've done this processing before. Don't let the fact that you're adding a file on top of it change that. OK, so yeah, I think I've said all that. All right. 7.8, word frequencies. Um, so this is where we're going to use the CSV stuff. And I've got a file name. Somebody's going to, you're going to ask the person what their file name is. They're going to input a file name. You're going to create an empty word list. So I'm going to open the CSV file. And I'm going to say, while there are more lines in the file, and it really looks like those two lines of pseudocode could be combined into one using the with statement. And then I'm going to basically say, um, I'm basically going to get everything out with the CSV re reader, and I'm going to assume it's a matrix. So I'm going to have two for loops, one for the row, one for the column. And then as long as it's not in the word list, I'm going to output the value of the row at the index and the row count at the index. And then I'm going to append the value of the row at the index to the word list. So again, you'll see that the majority of the stuff in here is stuff we've already done. It's list processing. The new stuff is just up here. And it's just how do I open the file? How do I read stuff in? In this case, you have to use CSV, the CSV reader. OK, 7.9 is like a mini project. There's a lot going on in it. And um, so just be mindful of that when you start this. 
give yourself ample time and don't get frustrated. If you're in my class, reach out to me and I will do everything I can to help. Um, so basically, um, you're going to have an input statement for a file name. You're going to um, open the file. You're going to output. So you're going to set an output list to the lines of the file. You're going to create an empty dictionary. You're going to create an empty list, and you're going to create a second empty list. And then um, just read the comments. If you're starting from the first item in the list, add every other item in the list as a key and every uh, even every odd item is the key, every even item is the value. We just saw a short example of how to do that. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're just going to go through odd, even, odd, even, odd, even and create this list because that's the first thing you have to do is you have to sorry you have to create this dictionary of um, the stuff in the file and what else do I want to say so you remove the new line you append it oh yeah you have to remember that there might be some new lines in there and some strange characters so you probably want to take care of that so this is part two. So once you've got your dictionary, you want to sort it. And then once you have the dictionary that's sorted by keys, um, you're going to populate, sorry, you're going to create another dictionary sorted by keys. And then you're going to um, change it from the dictionary to a list. And then you're going to split the list into a single list, and then you're going to sort it. And then you're going to actually get to the file stuff, the rest of the file stuff. So here you have to then write it and read it. Sorry, you have to write two different files, not write it and read it. We already did the reading. So here, we have to write in a specific format. We're going to write the key colon to the file, and then for item in value, so the rest of the items that are associated with that, we're going to write item plus semicolon to the file, and then we're going to write value at minus 1, to the file, and then we're going to write a new line to the file. So that's the special format that they want you to use. And then we're going to close the file. And then once we have closed that file, Python's actually, sorry, Zybooks is going to look at that file. And then, um, so we're going to open what we just created, which is output keys.txt, and we're going to, for item in show list.split, we're going to write item plus new line to the second file, and we're going to close it. This is a mini project. And it can be daunting. Take it in baby steps, literally. Start here. Open the file. Um, play with it. Spend some time with it. Don't get frustrated by it because there's a lot of stuff to do. But you'll notice the majority of the processing is creating that dictionary and then sorting that dictionary. And that's all stuff we've done. So if you're worried about the file stuff, my suggestion is you, you just um, you create this and practice with just the stuff that we know about, the for loops, the dictionaries. You can like I did in that one example, I just had a list instead of reading in from the file. So take it in baby steps and start with the stuff you know. And yes, um, if you do it in Zybooks, Zybooks is going to give you a hard time. If you do it in PyCharm, then move it back into Zybooks, it might be a little easier. Okay. 
So that's it for that, yes. And we can open up the mode. Um, AJ, I don't make the slides available. And the reason I don't make the slides available is because when I put a video up on YouTube, I have the rights protection of YouTube to say that this is my work. I don't put the slides, all of the slides up, because I don't have that same protection. Um, I do, however, put the pseudocode up. I put images of the pseudocode up and they're linked in the description. So if you're just looking for the pseudocode, it will be in the description. Okay, go ahead, Tom. And you can open up the, we can open up the mics now if you want, if that makes it easier, or you can type it in. Either is fine. Okay. All right, Sex exercise. It's killing me. Of course it is. Works for file one, but file two and three does it doesn't play. It's nice. Different output entries. Your file content. Okay. Expected. Okay. Okay. So that's reverse order. Bernie Miller. Mama Barney Miller. It looks like those are just in the wrong order. You are very close. You are very, very close. So it looks like these are just in the wrong order. They were just not sorted. Did you use the sort on them, the sort function? Yes. And it didn't sort them properly. Hmm. Yeah. This looks like it was reverse sort order. What they're expecting is a reverse sort. So you might just have to do a reverse rather than the dot sort and see what happens. Because that, that's all it looks like. It just looks like it's in the wrong order. So I would try, instead of a dot sort, I would try a dot reverse. to change rooms, to pull a keys value into the Pi game module and to play a different sound for each room. Um, you could. I haven't actually played with the, the ability of Python to play a sound from your computer. Um, so we would have to go out and look for a module that did that. So is it possible? Yes. So I knew how to do it off the top of my head? No. Um, Pi game does it. That's cool. So, speaking of games, do you guys have any questions about the, the game that you have to turn in next week? Because now is your time to ask. Do I have pseudocode for your game? No, I don't. Sorry. AJ, I would also take that in baby steps. Okay, don't look at it as one whole thing. Create small sections. Create your move between rooms function. And then test it out in a while loop. What happens if you put north in and there's no north in the dictionary? And I think, well, if you were here last week or if you looked video from last week, I do provide kind of a template to help out with the game. It's, it's only in the video. No, it's, it's actually up online as well. So there is a template in last week's video that kind of helps get you started and what you have to do for the game. Good job, Tom. It can often be difficult. Okay, definitely do that because I know, I think it's called dictionary.py. I'm not sure what the name of it is, but it's definitely up there because I made sure that I put it up there last week. 
Um, good job, Tom, on overcoming the whole exit condition. Does anybody have any other questions? About this week, about next week. Oh, and one thing I do need to say is I will be on travel next week, so I will not be holding a uh, Thursday night lecture. But there are lectures available from prior semester, prior terms, um, on the YouTube channel already. I will do my best to upload the video tonight. It takes a little bit. Free conference call has to that. I have to. It has to convert it from its format to MP4. But I will try and have this video up tonight. I will do my best. No problem. Does anybody have any other questions? I, I'm glad that these can be of help. Programming, especially when you're just learning how, is not an easy thing. There are lots of concepts, lots of terms, lots of formats that you have to remember. So I'm going to say then have a great night, everybody, and have a great rest of the term. Um, and for my students, I'll still be online. You guys go ahead and reach out to me. And uh, we'll go from there. So everybody have a good night and a successful rest of the term.